A pleasure to me all at last, and welcome once again to films I'm willing to talk about again. So, basically coming off of my release of Joker Fully Adieu, it was kind of a disappointment. Kind of midway, if you will, when it comes to my overall scoring, which is rare given the fact that I do give lots of movie a chance. Lots of movies do deserve a chance. But this one didn't really meet a lot of expectations, let alone surpass any. Which is normally the case with a lot of things. But in any case though, it's time that we do get back to business up until October 11th, in which that there will be some more films to talk about. Some of which, like Piece by Piece, might be worth a look. Or Monster Summer. I don't really know. In any case though, let's just go on ahead and start talking a bit more about some other films that I've been wanting to talk about again for some time. Let's take a look at Meet the Robinsons, released in 2007, a Walt Disney movie that was one of the first to utilize computer animation. And of course this was coming off of the height of the success of a majority of Disney and Pixar films. Pixar films of course would include the Toy Story films, Monsters Inc., A Bug's Life, etc etc and being that i talked a lot about those it eventually would be a good time to start talking more about disney related ones and even though disney and pixar are officially together now a happy couple they'll probably be around for a very long time it does seem that with the majority of new disney movies that have come around they do in fact do deserve a chance at some point so in the case of meet the robinsons it is in fact yet another good example of something that had been shown originally as a novel so kind of calling back to when I reviewed The Wild Robot but by all means I will still go so far to say that it is a good piece something worth remembering for a long time and it does seem that with a good majority of different movie adaptations especially ones that are more recent a good bunch of them have actually surpassed our expectations not only allowing us to delve deep into the world known as the book, but to also get a first-hand look at the kind of source material that we've been offered. Because if some of us are not into text, in pages, that's why they bring along the movies. So in this case, we have the story of an orphan child known as Lewis. Lewis is, of course, known to be a genius. Up until the age of 12, he had unfortunately come across some difficulty. Not just with finding a good family to be adopted from, but also with the many inventions he's created over the years. His life wasn't necessarily looked at with everlasting grace and a lot of positivity from his fellow orphanage, but there was the caretaker of the bunch. She herself actually was a kind-hearted person. A woman who actually saw potential with Lewis. And with the school that he goes to, as well as potential to showcase his inventions at Inventco, which is a high-rise building in his city, Lewis does have a lot of mind, a lot of creativity, a lot of knowledge about how things work, and a ton of things to look forward to. You know? He could likely go to college at a pretty young age, and he could very well get a big job with a big company, possibly Inventco or even higher than that. He could even start his own business. However, in the basis that Lewis has some unfortunate accidents take place, as times have gone by and some things have taken place, including a peanut butter and jelly sandwich maker that unfortunately allows a man to experience, to experience some serious nut allergies you know it had come to the point where lewis was about to enter the age of 13 and not have a family still so he basically started to reminisce on the day where his mother had left him on the doorstep and all he wanted to do at this point was to find out how to trace it back how to figure out what his mother's up to and more importantly how to find her and to do that he comes up with a device called the Memory Scanner. This device is in fact as impressive in design as its intended function is meant to be. 
That of which, of course, is to slip on a pair of headphones with a laser that specifically is designed to scan the cerebral cortex and retrieve certain lost memories that have been forgotten. And all I gotta do is input the date on a keypad and the monitor shall present whatever memory has been located within the brain. And so, upon revealing this at his school science fair, there are in fact a lot of people that are more than excited to see what he had come up with. But unfortunately, there's a certain kid who comes up to him claiming that he's some sort of time cop. Yeah, Wilbur Robinson, another boy, whom is a year older than Lewis, basically claims that there was a guy in a bowler hat coming around attempting to sabotage Lewis's memory scanner and possibly use it for evil deeds. And while supposedly the bowler hat was inside the science fair, Wilbur did have some difficulty finding him. And even more so, he ends up getting frowned upon by some of the other kids. A solar system, a bunch of frogs, and loads of other things end up getting ruined because of Wilbur's negligence. Yeah, he's not really the sharpest tool in the shed, but he at least had the good intention of trying to stop a saboteur from getting to young Lewis. Supposedly, Lewis is so well involved that this time cop basically shows up out of nowhere, claiming that he is going to be a success in life. And this memory scanner is the key to all this. However, though, when Lewis does finally test out his device, it unfortunately ends up breaking apart. Yeah, he tries to input a memory that was specifically put upon him as a baby on the night that he was left on the doorstep of the orphanage. And well, the machine unfortunately breaks apart in the instance. One of the parts ends up going up, causing some fires to roar, an exploding volcano of Mount Vesuvius, as a replica of course, a bunch of fire ants to go all over the gym teacher, and the sprinkler system gets deactivated because of the fire. This basically prompts everybody to evacuate. And Lewis, once again, gets so frustrated, he really goes on the verge of him supposedly being a failure. Then the bowler hat guy comes out of nowhere and steals the memory scanner right out of there with a nearby wagon. Wilbur, of course, chases after Lewis back to the orphanage where eventually he finds him on top of the roof. And Wilbur does try his best to disguise himself as a pigeon obviously Lewis knows who it is immediately and after an argument goes over they eventually agree to head over to the future to prove that Wilbur is from there and more importantly to get Lewis to go back to the science fair and try to start anew and when they do it's impressive in fact it is so amazing that Lewis just uses the time machine to try and go back to the past from where his mother was yeah Instead of a memory scanner, he could just use the time machine to get there to find out where his mother is. Obviously, Wilbur would not allow that to happen since he supposedly is not even allowed to drive the time machine himself or look at it. So, that apparently says a lot about his family. In the end, though, the time machine unfortunately does crash into something and plummets into the ground, causing it to be heavily damaged. Lewis and Wilbur eventually reworked their deal, where this time, instead of heading back to the science fair, Lewis is to head back to the past and see his mother firsthand. Wilbur does begrudgingly agree to the decision after supposedly realizing that his lie towards Lewis was nothing better than what Lewis himself had done. So, in the end, a 12 and a 13 year old are both failures to some degree. They do work out a deal to get the time machine up and running again using Lewis's own skills as a workman, a mechanic, and a multitude of other occupations that he himself could have already been a big part of. Meanwhile though, there's the bowler hat guy along with his flying hat named Doris. They do eventually try to work on the memory scanner in an effort to get it up and running, and more importantly, the master plan is set for Inventco. Yeah, I bet you didn't realize. 
that the Bowler Hike Eye and Doris are still in the past, whereas the others are in the future. Lewis and Wilbur do make their way to the garage of the Robinson household, where they encounter a certain voice behind the door. It apparently is a robot named Carl. Wilbur, of course, does have some disagreements with Carl's actions. While Lewis is very ecstatic to see a real robot in the Robinson household. Carl freaks out and heads up the tube, which does get me. But contextually speaking, the reason why this happens is because eventually Wilbur goes up the tube himself, asking Lewis to remain in the garage for the time being. And the thing is, is that why Carl freaked out is because he and Wilbur do get into some debates. Basically, Carl ends up scared for his own life, his own safety, and Wilbur feels about the same. But the thing is, is that when Carl does some calculations, he finds out that there is supposedly a very high chance that because of what happened in the space-time continuum so far, with Bowler Hat Guy's sabotage being successful and Lewis's career being off the rails, there's a very high chance Wilbur could end up becoming non-existent. And the future would be totally overwritten. So, much like Back to the Future, there are a lot of things about the past, present, and future, and time travel that are all put together here. The main concept is, whatever happens in the past affects the future. And as we know, lots of new things have proved that whole thing wrong. In any case though, when Lewis himself ends up going up the tube, he does try to find his way back to the garage, eventually encountering Grandpa Robinson, who basically has his head on backwards instead of his clothes. So, wrap your head around that. In any case though, they do search around the house, eventually get to know some of the other members of the Robinson family. Lewis himself is quite interested in most of them. There's Lucille, there's Bud himself, there's Spike and Dimitri, twins, whom are outside the house. Then there's a giant octopus named Lefty, whom is the butler of the house. Yeah. Uh, imagine if I had a talking fox or something as my butler. I wonder how that would work. Uh, either way you look at it though, it's an impressive level when it comes to understanding the Robinson family entirely. You have a guy who is morbidly obese, yet supposedly works out and is totally healthy. Yeah, kind of reminds me of the sumo wrestler lifestyle, where they're extremely heavy set, yet they are still on the very healthy side due to them having more subcutaneous fat than visceral fat. And then you have Lucille who bakes cookies by dancing. <laughs> yeah. I feel a dirty joke coming out of that. Here. Yep. And with everybody else put into play, Lewis does, of course, eventually encounter Wilbur again, once again, mad at Lewis. This time, he refused to stay in the garage. And when Lewis did reveal that he knows about Wilbur's family, a pop quiz takes place where eventually we find out Cornelius Robinson, the father of Wilbur and husband of Franny, looks like Tom Selleck. Yeah, that's awesome. It's kind of like when people start thinking I'm Leonardo DiCaprio. I have no relation with him. But, in any case though, when all is settled in the future, the past however is not. Because the Bowler Hat Guy does make his way to Inventco under an alias. And his invention unfortunately had flopped because he just cannot figure out how to make it work correctly. The men inside the room are pretty irritated with him and throw him out. So, this means that the Bowler Hat Guy is going to have to formulate a plan of some sort to get Lewis and to ask him how to operate it correctly. So, in any of all of these things that have happened so far, it's an impressive plot line that's taken place. You got one segment in the past which formulates a supposed master plan by the Bowler Hat Guy, while in the future, you got Lewis, whom is a visitor from the past, getting to know his own family. Yeah, that alone is awesome. I could never imagine 
being 50 years from now, where all of a sudden, I got myself an actual family. Wow. Now that I realize this, there's a lot of possibilities in the air. But apart from all the stuff that had happened so far, we really got to talk about the dinner event. Because the Buller Hat Guy does settle down in the future once again. This time hoping to kidnap Lewis. He tries to hypnotize one of the frogs into kidnapping Lewis. But after that fails, he decides to go to the past and fetch a certain surprise. Well, when dinner is settled down, you got yourself some nice spaghetti and meatballs that are served by Carl, as well as his little minions. You have a small conversation under the table, a little thing going on about Louis Armstrong, whom they confused for Neil Armstrong, or maybe it's the other way around at this point. Anything's possible. And then, of course, there comes the big moment. Carl decides to serve a second course in the form of PB&J sandwiches, utilizing an actual PB&J maker, much like what Lewis had. But after it jams, kind of like what happened with Lewis's, he is asked to work on the device. Meanwhile, after some time passes, it turns out to be a big failure. You know, probably even worse than the last time that he tried to get his own invention to work correctly. So twice he's failed, but this time everybody is congratulating him for it. You know, rather than it being the opposite, where in the past times were very complicated to live in for him. But now it's gotten simpler. His failure supposedly will lead to a success in the future. And that were the wise words of Franny Robinson. But you know what though? The real trouble starts. A T-Rex appears nearby. Supposedly they don't have a pet dinosaur, but Lewis somehow thinks they do, just because he's standing outside the house. But it turns out that it's actually another ploy from the bowler hat guy, as Wilbur eventually finds that out. But not before the dinosaur causes a lot of damage and basically takes down a good majority of the members, including Gaston, Art, Carl, and many others, you know? Even with all the ammo and stuff that they've put together, they just cannot take down this T-Rex. However, the T-Rex does end up facing its biggest weakness, its tiny arms. Because once it traps Lewis in a corner, he just can't get a hold of him. That is awesome. Instead of the dinosaur just going through with his mouth, like in Jurassic Park, they instead just try to have him going out with these tiny little hands that just cannot grab onto him. The bowler hat guy gets really upset with this, and man, it is just really funny. Like, the T-Rex is, is so stupid. Like, again, we're better off here in the present than in the past for a very good reason. So, that fails obviously as well because Wilbur is able to grab a hold of Gaston's meatball launcher and shoot off the little clone that Doris had created. Doris's own flying hat clone does unfortunately end up on the ground and gets locked away by the frogs after they find out that this was responsible for their hypnosis. So, talk about karma. And even more so when you get to know that Doris is even more mad at the bowler hat guy than, he, than she is at Wilbur for taking down her offspring. So, that alone is pretty impressive. How Doris can be even more angry at the bowler hat guy for taking something out of the past. Because let's face it, that T-Rex could have basically done anything to change the course of history. In any case though, when all settles down, the dinosaurs are mobilized, and everybody regroups, Lewis is basically welcomed into the family. Because when Franny was taught by Wilbur about how he was actually an orphan and not just some exchange student, well, she basically comes up with the idea to adopt Lewis. And that is when Wilbur reveals his hair. Yeah, underneath the cap, there was Lewis's own hair, which closely matches up with the likes of Cornelius Robinson. Remember, Cornelius is the father of Wilbur. Lewis is actually Wilbur's dad from the past. So it all made sense. Everybody else 
suddenly knew about it. Yeah, that's apparently what happens. When they find out that the hair on somebody matches up with somebody, that's apparently the dead giveaway, according to Wilbur. And right then and there, he just spoils it. You know, he like kills his own reputation, just like that. Franny grounds him for life, everybody else just leaves, and Lewis runs off away, very agitated. Not only for the fact that he's no longer welcomed into the Robinson family just because of what Wilbur had done, but also because apparently Wilbur had lied to him because he did after all promise Lewis that he would take him to the past to see his mom. And while supposedly this was originally arranged, but man, Franny was just livid with him for that. Both Wilbur and Lewis obviously were better off with each other at this point. So that's what they do. Lewis storms off far away and Wilbur follows pretty far behind at first. But when he does finally catch up to him, it turns out that the bowler hat guy was also not far off. He actually finds Lewis and invites him to find the real answer to his problems. Wilbur, of course, was too late to save him. And once they make their way over to an undisclosed location, well, Lewis, unfortunately, ends up getting tied up. Basically giving away the fact that it just takes a few certain functions to make the memory scanner work correctly. And the bowler hat guy gives out the classic crossies thing. They had a deal, but it doesn't count if you have this. In any case though, Lewis is even more shocked when he finds out that they're inside his old orphanage. The same old room that he had lived in for 12 years of his life. Yeah. And even more crazy, the twist really doesn't stop there. Apparently, the bowler hat guy is Mike Yagubian. Yeah, Mike Yagubian, a little league baseball player whom unfortunately failed to catch the ball at the very last minute of his game with the Dinos. Yeah. This apparently caused a lot of rifts in his relationships, not just with the orphanage, but with other people as well. Everybody grew up to hate him and started calling him names like Goob, for short, for Yagubian. The orphanage eventually was closed down and Mike just stayed there the whole time. Yeah. And supposedly, he blames Lewis for his actions. And what does he do? After many years of just laying around, listening to the radio, figuring out that Lewis becomes the one and only Cornelius Robinson, eventually setting off to create his own industries? Well, he enacts some revenge. Starts by shooting some eggs over at the Robinson Industries building. That's when he encounters Doris. Yeah, he finds Doris they go to a restaurant together where they talk about each other's pasts. Doris, of course, reveals that she used to be a big invention from Lewis, or in this case, Cornelius. And she apparently had gone rogue from her traditional programming. And so when they attempted to shut her down, she did manage to start up all over by herself to reboot her system and eventually escaping from the confines of the storage facility at the Robinson Industries. She basically not only escaped, but also found Mike. Coincidentally, who was after the same guy. Cornelius was not only hurt, but man, he was definitely in for a lot of pain. Because who would have thought that two figures who were both affected by the likes of Cornelius Robinson would end up going after him? It goes to show, whatever enemies you make back then, can likely come back to you later and possibly kill you. And that's pretty much what ends up happening in this case. Except in this exact situation, their master plan is to change the past by utilizing the memory scanner, passing it off as their own invention, as well as with the additions of other things that have come around. Mike Agubian does in fact manage to get out of there. He manages to head back to the past even though Carl, Wilbur, and Lewis managed to get out of there, you know, Mike still manages to persevere. 
he successfully passes off the memory scanner as his own, basically resetting from the last time that he went to Invenco to use the memory scanner for his own benefits, and successfully manages to get it working. And in addition to that, there was also helping hats, mostly because of the likes of Doris on his head, prompting him to basically create his own massive empire. And well, when the future manages to change off, lots of things go wrong for Lewis. Wilbur is erased from existence. Carl is left to rust. And as for the rest of the Robinsons, they're all possessed by Doris clones. Yeah. It turns out that that same memory scanner that was used against Lewis is now playing back a certain memory from which Mike had used the invention and also created the Helping Hats. And it turns out that the large amount of Helping Hats had all turned on humanity and started to create a massive empire for their own personal gains. Everybody's working like slaves and everybody has like no free will whatsoever. They're all under the might of the Doris army. And well, it turns out that's exactly what was going wrong all along with Goob's plan. Goob was basically being used by Doris the whole time for her own goals. She had gone rogue from her own programming and she had escaped the seals of the storage facility that she was kept in just to get revenge on Lewis. Unlike with Goob's intentions though, he only wanted to change the future to ruin the life of Cornelius Robinson, but Doris ended up going to the past and really shifting things around. I mean, it's insane. It's way worse than the plans that Goob had put together. He wanted to be more of a petty individual instead of somebody who was completely willing to annihilate humanity because of one man who ruined his life. You know? That is like the worst form of damage one can do. And when Lewis finds this out, he does manage to get to work on the old time machine. He may have had trouble with it before, but this time he successfully manages to do so. All the while, the Robinson family tries to kill him. And once he does get out of there, he basically sees everything around him. It's all a crappy land, so to speak. Lewis unfortunately does come across a larger sized Doris. One whom is doomed to take him down and with, even though he manages to turn back, he finds a ton of clones behind him. And so he's stuck basically in between them, realizing he invented the hat, but now it's time to set things right. He ends up making a trip back to the past and of course, he basically just stops right there at the Invenco office, right when Yagubian is putting up his signature. So, he warns him about what he's gonna do, and more importantly, what Doris is gonna try and do. Doris tries to stop him, but Lewis says he never will invent her. This basically just prompts her to fade from existence, just like that. Talk about it being not so climactic. Anyways, though, after a little trip with Goob, he eventually realizes that, boy, he really has misjudged Doris. He thought she was his friend, but boy was he wrong. Everything is restored to normal with the future. Even Wilbur comes back. But when he sees Goob right in front of him, boy, is he ready to fight. Lewis, of course, does oblige to Wilbur to not attack him because that is, after all, his former roommate, whom has now gone basically on the fritz. And after they have a little private discussion, knowing that Lewis is, in fact, Wilbur's dad, whom is Cornelius for the record, he does tell him that Goob is more than willing to change, should it be necessary. However, Goob ends up disappearing, nowhere to be seen. And all that's left is the notebook with one last piece, a question mark. Supposedly meaning he has no idea what he's gonna do. After all this time, he had supposedly been enacting revenge on Lewis. How the heck is he gonna carry on with all that? Well, when all is said and done, Cornelius himself arrives from his business trip. 
to find the time machines are gone. The thing is, when it comes to the time machines, that was a big invention that Cornelius himself had come up with. He woke up one night in a cold sweat, according to Wilbur, and he started working. Plans, scale models, and prototypes. From 1 to 9.52, they were all down in the toilet. But as we know, Cornelius Robinson made the famous model, Keep Moving Forward. He doesn't give up. And well, that's how he ended up with one time machine and later another one, both of which ended up having to be taken for certain needs. One was stolen and one had to be borrowed. So, we're happy here to run that too. Of course, Wilbur is the one to take the blame because he forgot to lock the garage to keep the time machine safe. And well, that of course was basically what it is. Lewis, of course, does have his promise to fulfill. So Wilbur does take him back to the past as promised. And well, what he finds is his mother right there. Basically, Lewis can just do what he wants. He could talk to her. He can try to reunite with her after all these years. Anything. Instead, he just chooses to hang back. Since he realizes his mother was really not that important after all. After all, lots of things happened with the space-time continuum. Well, with Lewis's invention and Goob's master plan happening, it was all a crazy ride. When Lewis does get back to his own time, though, and Wilbur was, well, heading back to his own time, Lewis does make his way back to the school, to the science fair, to tell his teacher he knows what happened. He's thankfully granted another chance and gets the memory scanner to work correctly this time. And when he does, this time he uses, well, Lucille. Yeah, I mentioned it, no. This is the same Lucille as well as Bud, who were basically the grandparents of Wilbur. Basically, the adoptive mother and father of Lewis, whom of course was known as Cornelius. And well, that's because he didn't look like a Lewis. He looked more like a Cornelius. Because of Lewis's prior knowledge to what had happened to the past, present, and future, he of course has all that he needs to get himself situated and acquainted and actually welcomed into the life of the Robinson family. Lucille, Bud, and Lewis, now Cornelius, all make way to the same house that eventually would be the setting for all the events in the future that would transpire. Except without Goob there to interrupt everything, they could just live a nice peaceful life and Lewis, or Cornelius in this case, can just do everything that he is sought after, including the construction of Robinson Industries as well as the time machines. Also get married to Franny, whom he of course also meets up with at the science fair. She of course decided to work on frogs to harness their unique power of singing playing instruments, and everything when it comes to music. Of course, Cornelius was the only person to think of it as not weird. So, they do build a relationship together. That's how we eventually end up with the Robinson family, where Wilbur is eventually brought into the world. And everything else, well, it carries on just like that. And that is basically what it is. Meet the Robinsons was a great piece that I have watched so many times and I could never get enough of. It has an amazing soundtrack, a nice cast, including some well-known actors that you might remember, like Adam West, for example. But you still can't quite get away from the fact that it's Disney. And Disney has always been known for making some amazing pieces over the years. So, by any means... You can drop a line, or you can simply give it another watch after many years have passed, and you likely have yet to remember what happens in the past should stay in the past and not transfer to the future. Because if it does transfer, anything could go wrong. Much like Back to the Future had shown us over 20 years prior. So, all in all, my revisiting of Meet the Robinsons 
was phenomenal. And for that, I'm more than likely to give this film a solid scoring. One of which that is to be simply laid out, from me at least, an 8.7 out of 10.1. So, while it doesn't exactly meet every possible expectation, it still holds on its own as an adaptation and more importantly, as a Disney movie. The kind of stuff we have today tends to go the extra mile in some cases, but for this, it's more casual and more on the safe side. So of course, that's just what it is. And I feel like that this was a pretty long one that I put together here. I ended up having to make two clips worth. But I guess it's worth it. However, I will be back with some more of the stuff. And there will be at least a couple more that I will do before I go to the theater again. And watch another piece that's come to life. Maybe piece by piece? Who knows? So, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, follow me wherever you can find me. And stay on the Hollywood side for more. I want you, but I don't have you yet. I ain't got no tricks uh, to be playing on you.